the most amazing traffic in the world. Let me first uh, acknowledge the uh, the spirit that has uh, that is being uh, lent to this occasion, led by no less than the celebrity lawyer, attorney Abjel Dan Elijah S. Fajardo, your national president, my former student. So, who would uh, have known a day that from your law school days, you would find yourselves in the center of things now. Attorney Marianne Iba Ibadlit, Governor for Eastern Visayas. Ibaulit. Ah, oh, Western, I'm sorry. Western Visayas. All right, let me make that correction. Is Judge Frank Lobrigo here? Judge, ah, there. Of course, the famous presiding judge Regional Trial Court of Legazpi City, who amazes me by his continuous uh, participation in the creation of jurisprudence by the cases that he brings to us. And of course, the uh, representatives of the Free Legal Aid Group. Flag is here. Members of Flag, can you just rise, please? Alternative Law Group, Marlon and Company. Thank you. Articulo Tres, people are here. Articulo Tres, na traffic. Okay, Center, Center Law. There. Of course, the uh, head of the National Commission for Legal Aid, June Ambrosio. Distinguished lawyers, friends, guests, of course, the co-sponsor of this event, Asia Foundation. Thank you very much for this, the support to this important occasion. Allow me to state what is already obvious to many, that the times are not only dangerous, they also demand that we make use of every available opportunity to advance the interests of the country while it is yet day, as the Bible says. I have only 15 minutes in this particular occasion to make my contribution to your two-day summit. So this speech will be brief relative to my usual speeches. Allow me first to congratulate all of you for putting together this most important summit where at the end, you expect to be able to come up with collective and individual courses of action to remedy what is an increasingly glaring atmosphere of impunity. In terms of understanding the legal context to analyze extrajudicial killings and their alleged relation to the war on drugs, which you had focused on in your invitation to me, one of the best ways actually would be to listen to the oral arguments on the constitutionality of Oplan Tokhang and Double Barrel at the Supreme Court. A second hearing on the same will be held this coming Tuesday, which is the continuation of the hearing held two days ago. It will now be the turn of government to defend its anti-illegal drugs campaign. However, on top of that, I have four ideas I want to share with you today. So bear with me. Hopefully, some of you will see them useful and develop some of these ideas on your own. First, allow me to restate what we should have always kept in mind from the very beginning. The framework of accountability in the Constitution is the best logical and operational framework to advance human rights. Now, this thought is not unimportant. Rather, allow me to show you why we should always keep that in mind. Now, second, that framework of accountability relies on the faithful discharge of duties by the independent institutions of accountability. And when I talk about these institutions of accountability, allow me to name the judiciary, and nearly all the independent constitutional offices. That is, 
the Commission on Audit, the Civil Service Commission, the Office of the Ombudsman, and the Commission on Human Rights. These are your independent institutions of accountability that are relevant to your topic today. Third, these independent institutions of accountability must work in parallel with other professional justice agencies namely the Department of Justice and its attached agencies. And to name a few, you would, of course, first recognize the National Prosecution Service, the Public Attorney's Office, the investigative arm of the Department of Justice, the National Bureau of Immigration, and eventually, after conviction, the Bureau of Corrections, and also the... Uh, its co-partners uh, after the Bureau of Corrections, the Boards for Pardon and Parole. Fourth, civil society and the bar, and that is you, must exert pressure on the institutions of accountability and the justice agencies to ensure that impunity ends. Accountability is consistently exacted, the rule of law is stabilized, and of course, resultantly, that human rights are protected. And allow me now to explain. The 1987 Constitution, instead of just being a skeletal statement of principles, is actually an organic instrument that provides the DNA, the genetic code for a governance that is based on the rule of law. It does this by sketching first the principles of accountability, and you can find this in Article 11, Section 1, and it says, Public office is a public trust. Public officers and employees must at all times be accountable to the people, serve them with utmost responsibility, integrity, loyalty, and efficiency, act with patriotism and justice, and lead modest lives. From this basic statement of principle, can be gleaned the foundational standard of accountability. And this standard of action and behavior continues to be fleshed out in greater detail in other provisions of the Constitution, in statutes, and further built up senior by senior by jurisprudence and appropriate operational or implementing guidelines. I would have wanted the ideal presentation of showing how from the Constitution, all of these are built up to form the standard by which human rights should be protected and advanced. Thus, for example, and when we come to the area of protecting human rights, several parts of the Constitution provides the direction that the state should take in addition to the Bill of Rights. And we have already a very detailed and long list of rights in a separate article of the Constitution. You can find related provisions on justice, on social justice, on freedom from poverty, and the protection of disadvantaged sectors. These are all related. But these constitutional goals and guarantees can only be achieved if you, by human beings, uh, by can only be achieved by human beings acting with state authority through institutions that are designed to achieve these goals and provide these guarantees. One key exercise, therefore, that I challenge you to do is to identify which government entity is responsible for which particular goal by constitutional design as well as by statutory mandate. And this is important, and allow me to <coughs> kindly make an observation. That, and in relation to the second idea, is that you need to go beyond the usual focus on the Commission on Human Rights, which of course is both constitutionally and statutorily mandated to protect and advance human rights. But you must widen your scope of analysis after you have seen especially how easy it is 
to weaken the CHR if, for example, the important financial support that should be given it is with health. And this you almost experienced in the past few months. Therefore, the conclusion is it must not only be the CHR, but other entities as well that must be challenged to go fully on the path of upholding human rights. And thus, I ask you to look closely at the judiciary, the Ombudsman, the Civil Service Commission, the Commission on Audit for their respective roles in protecting and advancing human rights. If you look closely at the mandate of the CSC, for example, it has already imposed standards and monitoring these standards of performance. And these performance standards that are required to be observed by every civil service employee, rather, every civil servant, in turn determines the entitlement of public officers to retention in office, promotion in office, or even their entitlement to financial incentives. In other words, the levers, the pulls, the stops that work in government bureaucracy are there for you to study and analyze. COA, on the other hand, can be made to ask investigative and law enforcement agencies, detention facilities offices, and the military and local government units whether their discharge of functions is effective or compatible with the protection of human rights. A police district, for example, can be asked by COA how it is using its resources in investigating extrajudicial killings when rampant killings in the area have been reported. The role of the judiciary is, of course, self-evident. When the IBP itself has lauded existing human rights risks. But we are actually at the stage of trying to look at whether additional remedies must be provided for. I wish to bring your attention to our recently promulgated decision in the Gadian case, which recognizes the sanctuary that the court can, status that the court can confer in favor of a religious order that the petitioner herself chose in order to gain protection from those she alleges to be assailing her life and security. Please ask our Chief Public Information Officer, Attorney Teddy Te, for information on this. The third point I wish to make is that protection of human rights can only be fully accepted by our people if we have a truly functional justice sector. A justice sector does not function if the investigative and prosecutorial services are not doing their jobs. When people complain about criminality, it means they are clamoring for genuinely effective police investigation, case buildup, and successful prosecution. Impunity is engendered because no one is being caught for crimes that our hapless citizens are suffering from. And when murders and rapes are being committed in such frequency and gore, you must expect people to be angry. They will not understand. If you try to protect the right to life of a drug suspect, when the community is of the belief that drug addicts are the perpetrators of these crimes. And this is something that therefore I will now suggest. Ultimately, you, the IBP, and the legitimate law and paralegal organizations must exert 
the same pressure on the police and the prosecution to solve and successfully prosecute the assailants and not leave it to just anyone who desires media mileage to own the issue of making the police accountable for unsolved murders, rapes, robbery, and widespread thievery. If the issue belongs to anyone, it belongs to you. If you keep silent about these crimes, wittingly or unwittingly, you will be in the subconscious of our people, be considered as indirectly complicit to what they perceive as day-to-day -day impunity. By your unjustly perceived indifference to the victims of rape, murder, and similarly horrendous activities. So what I am actually appealing to you is to rethink your position relative to these issues so that we will minimize the spectacle of kibitzers thrusting themselves in the public eye when they cannot even boast of the kind of track record of public service that you have. It is your accomplishments that must be lauded by the public, not those of publicity seekers. And I hope I do not get misunderstood when I say this. Fourth, pressure is important. Pressure must be continually built up. In all fora, venues, and information platform for all public officers to respect human rights to not issue any statement Ang narinig niyo po ay ang speech ni Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno sa Integrated Bar of the Philippines Human Rights Convention giniit ni uh, Chief Justice Sereno na ang accountability o yung pagkakaroon ng pananagutan ang ani ay best framework para maproteksyonan ang human rights o karapatang pantao hinamon niya rin ang IBP isa po itong grupo ng mga abogado na at iba pang parallel organizations para legal organizations na mag-exert daw ng pressure sa PNP sa prosecution government prosecutors at iba pang ahensya ng gobyerno para mapanagot ang mga nasa likod ng krimen, pati daw yung tinatawag niyang day-to-day -day impunity. Hamon niya sa IBP, wag daw manahimik para makontra ang mga krimen ito at maprotektahan ang karapatang pantao. Abangan ang iba pang detalye sa pahayag ni Sereno dito sa CNN Philippines.